Which of these tanks looks dead? When we think of marine species, we usually think of whales, fish, and massive corals. But let's go a bit closer. This is what life looks like on a very small scale. What you're seeing is a mix of copepods and algae, along with some crystallization from salt. At its very core, life in the ocean is very sensitive, and we need to be accountable for them. These organisms have been affected by changes in acidity and temperature in their habitats. This is what our project is about. But let's go back and see how we got here. All right, come on into the fish store here. I'll help you pick out a couple of thin fish, you know what I mean? <laughs> Like I said, one day can go from only like that to pure weight one day. And what it is, it's all it's doing is it's releasing its algae. Yeah. Because it absorbs algae just to get some color. It can come back. Uh, usually if you get bleaching, a lot of times we tell people when you buy a coral, put it low in the tank. Don't give it a lot of weight right away. But they do require five minutes. This is Eric, the owner of Fish Addicts. Fish Addicts is a store that sells fish, shrimps, corals, and a variety of marine animals. Fish Addicts was our major supplier of the organisms in our tanks and our tank equipments. So what is ocean acidification? Well, it's essentially the drop in pH of ocean water on Earth. Over the past few decades, the pH of the oceans have dropped from 8.2 to around 8.125. A 0.1 drop in pH does not seem like much, but because the scale is logarithmic, a 0.1 drop in pH actually results in a 30% increase in acidity of the overall waters on Earth. Apart from industrial waste, greenhouse gases are a major player in ocean acidification. CO2 is emitted to the air, not being able to escape Earth because of the ozone. But luckily, 93% of carbon dioxide is absorbed by the oceans due to its massive carbon sink. However, there's a limit to this carbon sink, and it cannot hold our endless carbon dioxide emissions. And when an excess amount of carbon dioxide is emitted to the air, that's when ocean acidification happens. Unfortunately, there are many negative effects of ocean acidification, and these issues are interconnected with each other. Yet the most dynamic visual effects are shown in our coral reefs. Corals are very sensitive to temperature and acidity and when the overall ocean temperatures stay high for a couple of weeks, the zooxanthellae they depend on for food leaves their body, leaving their skeletons bare. And that's what we call coral bleaching. The zooxanthellae that gives them that bright, living color leaves their body, claiming that the coral is in the process of dying. And when algae starts covering their bodies, it's officially the statement that that coral reef has died. Coral reefs are the home to countless marine animals. However, in the past two years, 50% of the Great Barrier Reef has been destroyed due to ocean acidification. This took away the biodiversity and the ecosystems, leaving the marine animals foodless and homeless. Calcification is a rate in which animals use calcium carbonate to form their shells for exoskeletons. And when the water remains supersaturated, the decrease in concentration of carbonate ions affects the integrity and the structural strength of these shells directly affecting the food chain. In the oceans, there are two main types of zooplankton that are crucial for the food web. Unfortunately, these organisms also rely on calcium carbonate to form their exoskeletons. And when these animals are trying to adapt to rapidly changing water conditions, they die before their bodies can act as a carbon sink underwater. No matter where you're living on Earth, you're affecting these environmental issues somehow. It is a horrible truth that many individuals are not aware or invested in this matter. However, oceanification will affect the individuals in need first. In 2011, the UN officially recognized oceanification as a global problem. Yet for many years, neither UN or any individual corporations made an effort to adapt to the changing oceans. I'm now here in France, Garde, a country where they recently joined the International Alliance to Combat Oceanification. Consequently, France has decided upon an 800,000 euro financial support for eight research labs to get to know the knowledge gaps in oceanification. And the lab results are to come out in 2020. 
but 2020 might be a bit of a long wait for a student like me. So with Enrique and a wonderful supporting teacher, Mr. Tim Stevenson, we created RADO, researching acidification and temperatures of the oceans. In this group, we created a year-long research project to study the direct effects of ocean acidification and global warming on the changing oceans. In the beginning of October, the tanks were installed with minimal supplies. Support and knowledge was restricted, so for a month, regulating temperatures, salinity, pH, nitrite, nitrate, and ammonia levels were crucial before we introduced new life into the tanks. Starting from late October, we started making data sheets to write down any changes in the chemistry and macroscopic changes in the water. We mostly kept an eye out for major alterations in rock color, algae, observable organisms, and the clearness of the water. After a few months of regulating the waters, we categorized the four tanks so that each tank would display a different ocean condition. Tank 1 would be the control tank where we maintained the perfect pH of 8.3, salinity of around 1.024, safe nitrite, nitrate, and ammonia levels with a temperature of around 24.5 to 25 degrees Celsius. This tank does not change throughout the year, and it is supposed to represent how a healthy ocean should look like. Tank 2 is a tank with a higher temperature of around 28.5 to 29 degrees Celsius to demonstrate the effects of global warming. We started increasing the temperatures over a course of a couple of months to demonstrate how the waters change so rapidly along with sudden increase in ocean temperature. Tank 3 is a tank with a lower pH, demonstrating ocean acidification. By adding certain amounts of carbonated water to the tanks regularly, we decrease the pH from 8.3 to 8.1. Tank 4 is demonstrating ocean acidification and global warming. The tank has a warmer temperature of around 29 degrees Celsius and a lowered pH of 8.1. This tank is the best demonstration of the current deadly states many of our oceans are in. Midway through our project, we realized that we needed another way to demonstrate the changes between the tanks. Photos and microscopic observations were significant, but the most striking differences were in the microscopic level. For the last couple of months, we trained in microscopy and decided to utilize it as our scientific method to calculate the changes between the tanks. However, because we did not have microscopic data from when we started the experiment, we decided to compare the data between the tanks during the last two months in order to examine the effects of global warming and ocean acidification correctly. It is obviously very hard for us to examine every drop of water in the tanks, so we selected certain spots throughout each tank to take five to six drop samples of the water near the tank walls, gravel, between rocks, on sponges, on heaters, etc. to get a fair amount of data for each tank to compare to the others. For each sample, we counted the number of phytoplankton, grain algae, red algae, and other microscopic animals that would help with the analysis of the tank's health. So after putting hundreds of hours into researching our tanks, what did we come up with? Let me show you. We collected enough data to analyze how much ocean acidification and global temperatures were affecting our tanks. So we subdivided our research into three categories, cellular algae, fibrous algae, and microorganisms. Let's have a look. So this is the graph for the fibrous algae. As you can see, the first tank has the perfect amount of fibrous algae because it has the perfect conditions. Secondly, we have the second tank, which had a higher temperature. This tank expressed very low concentrations of fibrous algae. It was very affected by temperatures. Then we have the third tank. And this tank had a higher acidity, which means a lower pH, but then the fibrous algae wasn't affected that much. As you can see, it's on the middle between the first tank and the second tank. Then we have the fourth tank, which had a higher acidity and also a higher temperature. This tank also expressed a very similar um, concentration as the third tank. Our research suggests that fibrous algae struggles the most at higher temperatures and also higher acidity. So the next graph that we have is cellular algae, which is a little bit interesting because it suggests that cellular algae actually survives better at higher temperatures. So as you can see, there's an increase in the second graph which implies that it actually did a little bit better on the higher temperature compared to the perfect conditions. But then we also have acidity, which also impacts and brings down the cellular algae in our tanks. So in the third tank, it did worse because of the lowered pH. 
and also that impacted the fourth tank which had lower pH and also higher temperature. And for the last graph we have microorganisms. This graph kind of looks a little bit similar to the previous one and it shows a very similar trend. What we have is organisms in tank number two did actually a little bit better than the ones in tank one. Higher temperatures allowed for higher growth and concentrations of microorganisms expressed in tank number two. But something more interesting happens when we bring down the pH. The organisms were almost completely white. As you can see in tank number three, we have very low concentrations of organisms. And that is because of the low pH. And then in tank number four, we also have a very, very similar, almost exactly the same um, concentration of organisms. And that is because of the low pH. So what is the takeaway? Throughout the year, we did research on a microscopic level, but also changes in the big picture, microscopic, were visible. We realized that ocean acidification brings down um, levels of organisms, but also increases the ugliness in our tanks. For instance, uh, Sylvia Earle, who's a, she's got a wonderful show on Netflix, not a show, but a movie, a documentary. Sylvia Earle, her documentary is called Mission Blue. You should all watch it. Sylvia Earle is the most influential researcher in the oceans uh, today. She's probably 80 years old. She is the queen of all knowledge of oceans. And she says, the greatest threat to the oceans today is ignorance. It's not industry, fossil fuels. It's ignorance and not willing to say, yes, we're capable of changing. So people say, I've asked her, should I have children? Is there a future? Is there hope? She says, if your children understand and can help, then yes, have children. Because we need a, the next generation. And it's my contention that the current student body in high schools today, their ra uh, awareness raises, and they're the ones that are going to go out, and they're going to set up massive marine sanctuaries, and they're going to develop technologies that will electrify cruise ships and airplanes, and it will happen. It took us 10 years to put a man on the moon. 10 years before they landed on the moon, they didn't have a rocket. So if they can do that, they can definitely do this. Mr. Stevenson, why should we care about the oceans? Why should we care about the oceans? Yeah. Because nothing in nature is as beautiful as this. And if beauty isn't reason enough, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> if you like to breathe, you should care about the oceans. <laughs>